French and Canadian Battles in France, 1915. Part 3. Festubert. May 15th to 25th. Section A. So, where was the Canadian 1st Division after being rebuilt, following their involvement in the Second Battle of Ypres? They had received 6,000 reinforcement troops and were also moved to northern France for a while. They certainly did not escape the battles there, but were involved in a battle well before the Battle of Luz. It was at Festubert. The Battle of Festubert, May 15th to 25th, 1915, was an attack by the British Army in the Artois region of France. The offensive formed part of a series of attacks by the French 10th Army and the British 1st Army in the Second Battle of Artois, May 3rd to June 18th, 1915. After the failure of the breakthrough attempt by 1st Army in the attack at Aubers Ridge on May 9th, 1915, tactics of a short hurricane bombardment and an infantry advance with unlimited objectives were replaced by the French practice of slow and deliberate artillery fire intended to prepare for an infantry attack. A continuous three-day bombardment by the British heavy artillery was planned to cut wire and demolish German machine gun posts and infantry strong points. The German defenses were to be captured by a continuous attack by one division from Rue de Bois to Chocolate Menier Corner and by a second division 600 yards 550 meters south which was to capture the German trenches to the east of Festubert. The objectives were 1,000 yards or 910 meters forward rather than the 3,000 yard 2.7 kilometers depth of the advance attempted at Aubers Ridge. The battle was the first British attempt at attrition. Background The Battle of Festivert was the continuation of the Battle of Aubers Ridge, May 9th, and part of the larger French Second Battle of Artois. The resumption of the British offensive was intended to assist the French 10th Army offensive against Vimy Ridge near Arras by attacking German divisions to the British front rather than reinforcing the defenders opposite the French. The plan. The attack was made by the British 1st Army commanded by General Sir Douglas Haig against a salient in the German lines between Neuve Chapelle to the north and the village of Festubert to the south. The assault was planned along a three mile, 4.8 kilometer front and would initially be made by Indian and British troops of the Garwal Brigade, 7th Meerut Division, together with the 5th and 6th Infantry Brigades of the 2nd Division, starting at 11.30 p.m. on May 15th. This would be the first British night attack of the war. The Battle The battle was preceded by a 60-hour bombardment by 433 artillery pieces that fired about 100,000 shells. This bombardment failed to significantly damage the front-line defenses of the German 6th Army, and the initial advance only made progress on the 6th Brigade front in good weather conditions. The attack was continued at 3.15 p.m. on May 16th by the original brigades plus the 7th Division which opened a front further south. Progress was again limited with casualties very high. 
On May 17th, the 4th Guards Brigade of the 2nd Division relieved elements of the 7th Division, but made minor advances only. By May 19th, the 2nd Division and the 7th Division had to be withdrawn due to their casualties, with the main objectives of May 15th still in German hands. On May 18th, the 1st Canadian Division, assisted by the 51st Highland Division, attacked but made little progress. In the face of German artillery fire, the British dug in at the new front line in heavy rain. The Germans brought up reinforcements and strengthened their defenses. From May 20th to 25th, the attack was resumed, but again made little progress. The offensive had resulted in a 1.9 mile, 3 kilometer advance. The next section is from What Matters, the Battle of Festubert. The aftermath of Aubers Ridge. The plan. Instead of planning an advance of three kilometers to Aubers Ridge, General Haig was now intent on moving forward about a kilometer as far as La Sancaru, running eastwards out of Festubert. The infantry would still attack two positions simultaneously, but only be 500 meters or so between the pincers, as opposed to the kilometers previously tried. Major General Hubert Goh's 7th Division would attack from north of Festubert, while Major General Henry Horn's 2nd Division would advance out of the Rue de Bois, north from Chocolate Menier Corner, named after an advertising holding, supported by a brigade from the Indian Corps on his left. As the 2nd Division already knew the area well, General Horn proposed that they carry out a night attack to gain the German front line and then wait on the 7th Division's attack in daylight. General Haig ordered that the bombardment by 121 howitzers and 312 field guns should open on the morning of the 13th May 1915 and continue relentlessly throughout that and the following day. The batteries were registered onto their targets by forward observers, noting that many of the howitzer shells were still failing to explode. The munitions available allowed for a hundred rounds per field gun per day, and half that for howitzers. In other words, four or just two rounds every hour it was also only possible to shell those positions on the front to be attacked. The flanks had to be left untouched. Over the next 60 hours, the British guns would fire off 100,000 rounds, a formidable number at this stage of the war, and one that would require weeks of manufacture to replace. Clear weather turned miserable on the 12th May, which made observing the effects of the bombardment difficult. As it cleared again on the morning of the 14th, the eve of battle, Haig asked his divisional commanders if they were happy that enough had been done to render success reasonably certain. Go was confident. Horn was worried that, that the now sodden ground might prove an obstacle, while Lieutenant General Anderson of the assisting Meerut Division was far more skeptical. I do not consider sufficient damage has been done to ensure the success of the assault tonight, nor from the artillery reports is it likely to be completed in time. With Sir John French's agreement, General Haig 
postponed his attack by 24 hours, increasing the bombardment from 36 to 60 hours. Saturday, May 15th, turned out to be bright and sunny, and the attacking formations moved into position. Surprise was out of the question, but a few decoy runs had been planned into the barrage in the hope that when the assault began, the Germans would not realize that this time the crescendo was for real. The Night Attack Already familiar with the area, the 2nd Division, commanded by Major General Henry Horn, had opted to commence the Battle of Festiburg with a night assault. The 6th Brigade would attack on the right and the 5th Brigade on the left of a front spanning about 1,200 meters. They were supported by the 4th Guards Brigade and were to be assisted by units of the Lahore and Meerut divisions of the Indian Corps, a further 400 meters on the left. Between the two British and Garwal brigades, the number of assaulting troops amounted to about 10,000 men. Opposing them was the 55th Infantry Regiment, which had two of its battalions in the front line, and a third in reserve. The Germans were thus outnumbered by about 5 to 1. This would be the first British night attack of the war. The Canadians had already done a night attack at Kitchener's Wood on the night of April 22nd to 23rd during the Second Battle of Ypres. On a dark overcast night, the first troops crept out over the British parapet at 2330 hours on May 15, 1915. They had light bridges with them because just in front of the British front line there was a four meter wide ditch filled with water up to the depth of over a meter. The ditch was traversed and the leading troops continued to creep out into no man's land and to the jumping off points. On the right the 6th Brigade, with the 1st of the 7th Battalion, Kings, 1st Battalion, Royal Berkshire, and 1st Battalion, KRRC, managed to walk across and all but up to the German breastwork before the Germans had time to react. Most of the defenders fled through the communications trenches, leading past the Ferme de Bois, and the German front line was seized with hardly a shot being fired. Support companies moved forward and took possession of the German support trench with just as much ease. The casualties had been light, though the 1st Battalion KRRC had lost its commander, Major Shakerly. All was ready on the 6th Brigade front for the opening of the daylight assault by the 7th Division on their right. Unfortunately, the story on the left was from a different book altogether. The Lahore Division on the far side of La Basse Road had been given orders to lay down rifle and machine gun fire periodically during the evening's bombardment. This had taken place and aroused the suspicions of the local German commanders who found the action out of the ordinary. The German sentries spotted the bridge laying parties and when the bombardment lifted at 2330 hours the sky was lit by every means the Germans had available. Rockets, flares, searchlights. As the 5th and Garwell brigades began their advance into no man's land they were scythed down by the alerted defenders. The only ray of hope for the sector was on the far right where the 2nd Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers, closest to the 6th Brigade, managed to get, into, get their right flank into the German lines. They tried to bomb their way north with grenades 
but the Germans swiftly put in a trench block and held their position. As the first reports of the attack reached Corps headquarters, it was decided to mount a second assault at 0315 hours, coinciding with the attack by the 7th Division. A 30-minute bombardment was delivered on the German positions, but the defenders had been given more than sufficient time in which to organize. In front of the 6th Brigade, the Germans hastily prepared a new front line with the aid of flanking fire on their old positions and managed to halt the British from making any further advances. For the 5th and Darwell Brigades, the dawn attack brought more woe as the soldiers attempted to cross the 300 meters of no man's land. The Inniskillings had almost been obliterated with 649 casualties. The other three British battalions had all suffered over 300 casualties each, and the 39th Garwell Rifles lost 154 soldiers. The dawn attack by the 2nd and Meerut Division had failed. The 7th Division was on its own. 16th May, 1915, 7th Division. Although the 7th Division had a front of 850 meters to assault, Major General Hubert Goh ordered that a buffer zone of a further 350 meters on either side of the attack zone should also be bombarded. The bombardment increased its tempo at 0245 hours, and for the next 30 minutes, the gunners fired for all they were worth. The assault at 0315 hours was to be carried out by the 22nd Brigade on the right, astride the Rue de Calou, and the 20th Brigade on the left, either side of the road leading south from Chocolate Menier Corner, and known to the soldiers as Prince's Road. Opposite them, the 57th IR had just one of its three battalions covering almost two kilometers of the front line, opposite the 7th Division. It would be reasonable to suggest that the two British brigades were opposed by two German companies. The British intended to take the German front line which was from 75 to 150 meters away from them. And then, having done so, seize a position a kilometer further on, known as the North Breastwork. This was a makeshift defense line made up of sandbags, but without a trench. The 2nd Battalion Queens and the 1st Battalion Royal Welsh Fusiliers led the way for the 22nd Brigade. They were hit almost the moment they rose from heavy fire. The Fusiliers lost Lieutenant Colonel Gabbett within moments. The German trench was stormed and the bombing parties immediately sent out to the flanks to work their way down the trench system. In support, the 1st Battalion South Staffordshire Regiment worked their way southwards until they reached the point where the trench crossed the North Breastwork. Here they consolidated at Staffordshire Corner. The Queens pressed on and reached the North Breastwork at 0600 hours, but it would take another 50 minutes for the Bucillers to come abreast of the orchard. It is now a camping site opposite a large sawmill. By 0700 hours then, the 22nd Brigade had secured its objectives, but at a considerable cost to the assaulting battalions, who were now too reduced in numbers to advance any further. To the left, the 20th Brigade had a far harder time 
The leading waves were provided by the 2nd Battalion Scots Guards and the 2nd Battalion Border Regiment. Both units had been told to attack at 0310 hours. In other words, five minutes before the bombardment had finished shelling the German parapet. The borderers in particular got far too close to the final moments of the bombardment and lost men needlessly. The German position was taken nonetheless, but the borderers were then held back by flanking fire coming from a German stronghold called the Quadrilateral, a name often given to such positions. A slight lack of imagination, one might suggest. The Quadrilateral was in the zone between the two divisions, and as the second division's own dawn attack had come to nothing, the Germans in the redoubt were almost unmolested. The Scots Guards, however, pressed the attack, and with the aid of some lost Welshmen who had drifted over to the left, managed to gain their objective, which was the road running alongside the orchard. Unfortunately, the Right Hand Company was then shelled out of its newly won position by the British artillery, which left the remaining Scots dangerously exposed to counterattack. Running back from the quadrilateral was a communication trench called, by the British, Adelbert Alley. It ran as far as the German rear lines, and being well constructed with a sandbag breastwork over a meter high, facing the both sides. Caught in the flank by a counterattack emanating from Adelbert Alley, the Scots Guards and Welsh Fusiliers were forced back to a position where the support companies of the Guards were using an old disused trench. By 0900 hours, the assault across the 7th Division front had been stalled. The intended linking up of the 2nd and 7th Division had failed to materialize, leaving a sector of about half a kilometer of the German front line between the two divisions intact. From there, the Germans were able to harass the flanks of the units that had advanced the furthest. Continuing the battle. By 0900 hours, Lieutenant General Sir Charles Munro, commanding 1st Corps, had assertion that the offensive had stalled, leaving a large gap between the two neighboring divisions, the 2nd to the north and the 7th to the south. It was thus imperative that operations were put into action in order to close the gap down. The 6th Brigade, 2nd Division, were therefore to work southeastwards, while the 7th Division, which had suffered difficulties on its left flank, were to make a further effort to link up to the northeast. The maneuver was supposed to have begun at 1000 hours, but the 6th Brigade was being so heavily shelled they couldn't get sufficient supplies forward to undertake the assault. On the front of the 20th Brigade in the 7th Division, the 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards managed to get across no man's land as far as the Scots Guards, and from here the two battalions mounted an assault towards the quadrilateral stronghold by bombing along the trench. They took a number of prisoners and advanced 300 meters, but an attempt to attack across the open was put to ground with heavy losses. On the far right in the 22nd Brigade, the 1st Battalion, South Staffordshire, not only consolidated their position, but increased it by bombing their way southwards for a further 400 meters until they were opposite the front held by the 47th Division. Next to the grounded 20th Brigade, however, 
the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, who had gained the North Breastwork, were unable to push the Germans out of the orchard. With their left flank in the air and coming under increasing artillery fire, the decision was taken at 19.30 hours to abandon the position and retire back to the Saint Peru. The remaining 200 or so men from the Queen's Regiment next to the Fusiliers also fell back, but the Staffords held on to their newly won positions westwards from Staffordshire Corner. During the night, most of the battle-worn units were relieved. The Germans retire. General Haig had spent most of the afternoon of the 16th May visiting each of the corps and divisional headquarters of the units involved in the offensive. He came to the conclusion that on the left the problem was one of artillery. It seemed impossible for the British artillery to master their adversaries. Trying to continue to take the Ferme Corps d'Avoue and the Ferme du Bois would be difficult, as it was not possible to counter the flanking guns at Lorgier. On the right of the battlefield, the situation appeared more positive. If the gap between the 2nd and 7th Divisions could be sealed. 1st Corps was therefore ordered to close the gap and secure a line running along the saint Rue from Festerberg to the Ferme Corps d'Avoue. That achieved, a defensive left flank would be formed from the captured zone back to the old British front line. What was not realized was that during the night, the Germans themselves had decided to pull back along much of the sector, as far back as the Ferme de Bois to a new front line about a kilometer to the rear. The quadrilateral was subjected to a heavy bombardment which destroyed most of its defenses. Its garrison of 400 men was all too happy to run the gauntlet towards the British front line and surrender. When it became evident that it would not be possible for them to fall back safely. In fact, a pilot from 16 Squadron RFC had noticed new trenches in the rear of the Ferme Corps d'Avoue, but the information was ignored, and as the weather closed in, the chance of finding out if the new trench ran the entire length of the front was lost. By 0900 hours, most of the German troops in the area of the Rue de Calou had been withdrawn. When the 2nd Battalion Royal Scots Fusiliers of the 21st Brigade advanced against the German front, they found few left to oppose them. By 10-15 hours, the quadrilateral was in their hands. The 1st Battalion King's Regiment were on their left, attacking from the 6th Brigade sector. Their right managed to link up with the Scots Fusiliers, but their left came under very heavy fire from the Ferme Coeur d'Avoue and were halted. The first reports of the general success suggested to General Haig that the Germans were seeding ground and gave orders that the momentum apparently gained had to be continued. The 3rd Canadian Brigade was placed at the disposal of 1st Corps and the Indian Corps were instructed to take over ground to the right in order to allow 2nd Division to concentrate its efforts. It was essential, Haig told his commanders, that a firm base along the saint Rue be founded before a large-scale advance was attempted. His orders from Sir John French, commanding the British Expeditionary Force, had also changed. The objective was no longer the Augers Ridge, but La Basse and the canal. A second attack 
by the 2nd and 7th Divisions was ordered for the early afternoon, but both ran aground without achieving a great deal. The 2nd Battalion Wiltshire Regiment managed to get up as far as the North Breastwork, but were forced back again by enfilading fire from the new German front line. The Scots Fusiliers, who had already been bombarded once by their own artillery during the morning, were subjected to the same treatment in the afternoon and lost a heavy number of casualties for the second time. The 5th and 6th Brigades of the 2nd Division were also supposed to have launched an assault at 1500 hours against the Firme de Corps d'Avou, but postponed the attack until they could be reinforced by the 4th Guards Brigade, marching up from La Torre, five kilometers away. The roads were packed, and it was almost dark by the time that the guards finally managed to reach the Rue de Calais. It was too late to do anything other than move some of the units up into the front line. The 2nd Battalion Grenadier Guards, finding itself alongside the 1st Battalion, 20th Brigade, 7th Division, for the first time since the war had broken out. On the far right, the 2nd Bedfordshire and the 1st of the 4th Cameron Highlanders of the 21st Brigade advanced against the South Breastwork, which, unbeknownst to the British, formed part of the new German front line. With little to no preparation, the two battalions had advanced across the 400 meters of no man's land, which was heavily interspersed with waterlogged ditches. The Highlanders managed to get into the German lines, but the Bedfordshires were held up twice during the course of the afternoon. The Highlanders had lost all their grenades while getting over the ditches, and were forced out of their position by counterattacks from the flanks. Between them, the two battalions suffered 700 casualties. After battling throughout the day, both sides settled down for a quiet night in the pouring rain. The Relief of First Corps. The rain, which had begun the evening before, persisted through the night and rendered all thoughts of continuing the attack at 0900 impractical, and the infantry were stood down. Sir John French visited General Haig at Merville late in the morning, as the weather began to clear, and announced that he was pleased with the way things were going. At 1355 hours, Haig issued orders for a renewal of the deliberate bombardment at 1430 hours. The infantry would attack at 1600 hours. The brigade commanders were therefore given no more than two hours notice to prepare for the battle. For the first time on this battlefront, the Canadians of their third brigade were going to be used. They had been attached to 7th Division and they were ordered off to attack the St. Cru, alongside the 4th Guards Brigade of the 2nd Division. As things turned out, the artillery hadn't been given the word to commence until 1500 hours. When they did begin the bombardment, it was noted to be quite efficient. The problem was, of course, that the Germans had pulled back, and the areas being shelled although close, were sufficiently far away to leave the new German positions relatively untouched. The Germans were obviously alerted, and when the guards closed on Ferme Cordavu, they were stopped in their tracks by machine gun fire. With half of their leading units already casualties, and a further 400 meters of open ground to cover, Lord Cavan called his men back. The Irish guards had suffered 430 casualties 
in the space of a hundred years. By the time that the Canadians had received their orders and marched to the front, the guards had already been recalled, and the battle was as good as over. They attempted to take the orchard and generally pushed the line forward as soon as they arrived at the front, but, like the guards, suffered high casualties and were recalled. First Corps was now exhausted from three solid days of fighting, and General Haig issued orders that the 2nd and 7th Divisions should be pulled out of the line and replaced by the 51st Highland Division and the 1st Canadian Division. Once in place, the offensive would continue. By the morning of the 20th May, the changeover had been completed. The 3rd Canadian Brigade, CEF. By 0900 hours on the 20th May, 1915, the 51st Highland and the Canadian Division, under the title of Alderson's Force, occupied the front line between Festuberg and the Ferme du Bois. The 47th London Division remained on the southern flank, and the Indian Corps holding the flank to the north. The 3rd Canadian Brigade consisted of four battalions. Number one, the, first, the 13th Battalion, Canadian Infantry, Royal Highlanders of Canada. Number two, the 14th Battalion, Canadian Infantry, Royal Montreal Regiment. Number three, the 15th Battalion, Canadian Infantry, 48th Highlanders of Canada. Number four, the 16th Battalion, Canadian Infantry, the Canadian Scottish. The three Scottish battalions wore the kilt. The brigade had just been involved in the heavy fighting at Ypres. During the gas attacks launched by the Germans, on the 22nd and 23rd of April, the 13th and 15th battalions, in particular, had been right in the middle of one of the gas zones. The March South. The 48th Highlanders of Canada. On May 11th, the 15th Battalion received its orders to leave the Ypres salient and to follow the 14th Battalion. Destination unknown. On May 14th, they arrived at Robique, where they remained until May 17th. At 0300 hours, the battalion received its marching orders to move to Richebourg and then the second line behind the Saint Cru Festibert on May. 18th. That very afternoon at Festiburg, the 14th and 16th battalions had attempted to take the orchard at a stronghold known as K5 on the maps. It needs to be remembered that in this flatland, where water can be found just under the surface, the trenches were usually shallow affairs with forward breastworks solidly built up out of sandbags with fire positions at suitable and mutually supporting positions. Those in the German positions in this area were particularly well constructed. Artillery versus breastworks. In torrential rain and following an inadequate artillery preparation, the result should have been foreseen. Unbeknownst to the British staff, the Germans had recently pulled back along much of the sector to a new position. With a poor idea as to the exact location of the German line, the Montrealers advancing in open view across a muddy field were ferociously dealt with by the German machine guns hidden across the ground. Their losses were so bad that they had to be replaced in the line. As for the Canadian Scottish, they managed to get as far le, as Le Saint-Cru, but were quickly disabused of any possibility of 
being able to go further. The Canadians were given little time to get to know their new front. May 20th, 1915. Early in the afternoon, Lieutenant Maver and four NCOs from the 15th Battalion took themselves up to the front on a reconnaissance mission. They were stunned to find that, in fact, there were no trenches in this sector. The various minor advances since the opening of the battle had created a totally new position, and the brigade's scheduled attack would simply commence from La Sainte Rue itself. The lieutenant continued alone and soon located a trench in front of him. The hint that it was occupied by the Germans was the number of bullets whistling above his head. Lieutenant Colonel Marshall gave his orders to his men. The battalion will advance on a two-company front, on the right flank of the 16th Battalion, which was going to make a second attempt to take the orchard. On the right, the 2nd Canadian Brigade would deal with the K-5 emplacement. The Highlanders would advance with number two company, Captain Smith, on the left, and number four company, Captain Malone, on the right. Number one company would act as support, and number three company would remain in reserve. Captain Musgrove, number three company, would be in overall command of the attack. The sergeants were given flags to mark out the advance and word from on high was that the German lines would be obliterated by artillery. The soldiers had heard this before, and to their cost. That morning, the sun made an appearance in the sky, and by the evening of the attack, a light mist from the steaming mud hung over the field, along with the smell of hundreds of bodies still lying out between the lines. The unlucky were from various counties of England, Scotland, Indians, Bavarians, and from the past few days, Canadians. Captain Musgrove scanned the ground with his binoculars. There were three strongholds in front of his men, three houses, M6, M7, and M8 each manned by machine gun teams. The bombardment was far too light to make any impression on such fortifications. At 1945 hours, the order to attack was given, and the Highlanders rose, and began their advance across the ground. They were completely out in the open, and the German machine gunners had a field day against such obvious targets. The Highlanders advanced by leaps and bounds of 20 meters, losing contact with each other in the mess of shell holes and barbed wire. They paused after 100 meters, and their captain ordered them up and on again. The house, M8, hadn't even been touched by the artillery, and the only smoke about it that the captain could see was that of the machine gun hidden within. Another hundred meters, but the losses were terrible. Captain Musgrove himself was badly injured. He would lose his arm after the battle. Lieutenant Muir tried to take M8 in a rush, but was killed in the attempt. The battalion's machine gun company had been all but wiped out in the opening moments and without their supporting fire, the soldiers couldn't get any further forward. On the left, the 16th Battalion had won the battle for the Orchard, thereafter known as Canadian Orchard, and now the Highlanders pulled back to the North Breastwork. For the Highlanders of the 15th Battalion, the battle was finished, but for other units, the battle slogged on until 
May 25th, with very little more to show for it. May 25th, the final day. One final attempt to break the German line was still to take place. On May 23rd, General Haig discussed matters with his subordinates. A combined attack by the 47th London Division and the Canadian 1st Division would be launched on May 25th. The objectives would be the Chapelle Saint Roche and the Rue de Rovelle. On May 24th, the 140th Brigade, alongside the 2nd Canadian Brigade, managed to advance the line by another 150 meters, but the old problem of flanking machine gun fire prevented any great incursions into the German line. At 1830 hours on May 25th, the 47th Division attacked with the 142nd Brigade, the 1st to 23rd and the 1st first and the 24th Battalions of the London Regiment. The entire division was made up of territorials. Took both the German front and support trenches. Their success represented an advance of about 400 meters on a width of a kilometer. They were now put under pressure from flanking artillery fire that their own artillery was, artillery was unable to counter. Despite heavy losses, the Londoners stood firm, but could do no more. They did, however, see off at least one counterattack. They might not be able to go forward, but they were not going back either. The Canadians on the left made some progress, but their artillery lacked enough shells, and they were at the stage of the war still fighting with the Ross rifle, which had already been shown to be unreliable in the mud. Many Canadians threw them away if they found a British Lee Enfield. The Ross rifle was finally abandoned in June 1915. The Germans spent the next 48 rifles, 48 hours, trying to claw back some of the lost ground. But they were beaten off as easily as they had withstood the British attacks. The close of operations. On May 24th, the Battle of Belouerde Ridge had opened in Belgium. But despite this, Sir John French agreed to General Foch's request on the 25th that the British relieved the French 38th Division, south of La Basse Canal. This would aid the French, who were still mounting operations against Vimy Ridge, as Vimy Ridge was of great strategic importance. Sir John agreed, and the 2nd Division moved south on to what would become the Luz Battlefield. That same day, Sir John informed General Haig that with ammunition stocks almost depleted, it would be impossible to continue the offensive. First Army was to consol consolidate its position and prevent the Germans from transferring troops against the French. The cost. For a kilometer of progress, the Imperial armies had lost about 17,000 men. The Germans had lost about a third of that, and only 500 prisoners. The failure at Aubers Ridge had already caused a political crisis in Britain, after Sir John French mentioned to a journalist that insufficient and faulty ammunition was getting his men killed. The Asquith government fell, and a new coalition government brought with it a Minister of Munitions, David Lloyd George. To the south, the battle continued. The Germans were hanging on to every house in Nivelle-Saint-Vaast and refusing to be expelled 
till June 9th. On May 22nd, the hill of Lorette was at last in French hands, but the village of Ablain saint nazaire in the valley remained German for another week. General de Herbal's 10th Army was exhausted and the losses had been considerable. The great cemeteries at La Targette and Notre Dame de Lorette, which is the largest of France's military cemeteries, bear witness to the suffering of the French infantrymen. In September, the French army would launch an offensive that would finally take Suchet. It would be supported by a British offensive across the plains towards Luz en Gohel. As for Vimy and its rich, it would be necessary to wait for the arrival of the Canadian Corps in 1917 to finally see it definitively in Allied hands. The Aubers Ridge, though, had far from seen its last battle. Three battalions of the Sussex Regiment would be massacred at Richbourg on June 30th, 1916, in a diversionary attack that went so wrong that it was forgotten about. Another nation would be asked to try to break the Germans at Promels in July 1916. This was the Australians in their first combat experience on the Western Front. In May 1918, it would be the turn of the Germans to try and breach the Allied line, held by a badly equipped Portuguese Corps. We will now look at the information from the Canadian military historian Tim Cook's book, At the Sharp End, Into the Maelstrom, Festivert, May 1915. Hard fighting and a damned lot of it, was Sir John Colborne's explanation for his rise through the ranks in Lord Wellington's army in the previous century's great war between the European powers. With his superiors killed off or maimed or promoted to fill the ranks of others above them, Colborne had shown his competence and had also risen through the ranks. A hundred years later, a similar situation had developed in the first contingent, which had now lost a third of its force on little less than half of its infantry. New leaders rose to replace the fallen, knowing there would be a damn lot of hard fighting in the near future. After the devastating trial by fire at Ypres, the survivors marched south, some of them wearing uniforms cut to rags by bullets and shrapnel. While most were missing key parts of their kit that had been abandoned on the battlefield, many were suffering from shell shock or the effects of gas poisoning. Men fell out of formation during the march to lie down by the side of the road. A few were even reported to have succumbed to their gas wounds. After the arduous and some complained, Collis march. The telegrams of congratulations that flowed into the Canadian Division headquarters from throughout the Army and Empire were of little consolation to men who had seen their best friends torn apart during a week of gut-wrenching fighting. By the beginning of May, however, the men of the Canadian 1st Division began to recover from the strain and fatigue of the last two weeks. Through participation in sports, light drill, and inspections. New clothing was issued, along with 
early generations of respirators to protect against poison gas. The first of these, cotton pads that were fastened around the mouth and nose after being wetted, had been sent from England by patriotic women who formed sewing groups to meet the army's desperate pleas for protection. But citizens at home also demanded revenge, and soon the British were organizing their own offensive chemical warfare companies. In the meantime, the newspapers and propagandists took every opportunity to remind the public of the Hunnish barbarity. Reinforcements were also called up and rushed across the channel to be integrated into the mangled Canadian forces. Four battalions had lost their commanding officers, and hundreds of experienced and trusted officers and NCOs had been killed or wounded. More than 6,000 fresh troops arrived from England, and many of the units that had considered themselves homogeneous to a certain region of Canada soon found men from across the Dominion in their ranks. To fill the gaps at the higher echelon, a number of sergeants and corporals who had proven their mettle during the Ypres battle were commissioned as officers, while new lieutenants and captains coming from England attempted to find their place among these bloodied veterans. Jack Pinson, a raw recruit for the 7th Battalion, remembered. We were all goggle-eyed looking at these old-timers who had been there about two months before us. But with another British offensive looming, these new men would soon have a chance to prove themselves or die trying at Festubert on the La Basse front. The Battle of Festubert was fought by the British 1st Army against the German 6th Army from May 15 to 27, 1915, as part of French Commander-in-Chief Joseph Joffre's Artois Offensive, which started on May 9th, while the British 2nd Army was still battling in the Ypres Salient. On that day, the French launched a 21-division offensive against Vimy Ridge and the high ground near Notre-Dame-de-Lorette. They almost captured the, front, the enemy strong point on Vimy Ridge, overlooking the French lines, before being hurled back into the mud by German counterattacks. Despite these setbacks, Joffre continued to stoically throw his troops against formidable positions, even though each time they were chewed up by the enemy's guns. Total French casualties numbered around 100,000, a sacrifice that made no appreciable gains around Notre Dame de Valette and Vimy Ridge. While the Germans lost about three quarters of that number in trying to deny their enemy the ground. To support the French, the British First Army also attacked the enemy strong point around Aubers Ridge. However, like the French offensive, it failed, and eight divisions suffered almost 12,000 casualties. This and previous offensives along the Western Front had demonstrated that German defenses were sound as they fortified their positions and held the trenches strongly. The French and British armies lacked sufficient artillery shells to shatter the enemy positions, but they were unwilling to sit in their muddy ditches waiting for the Royal Navy blockade to slowly strangle Germany. This naval strategy might eventually force a cessation of hostilities, assuming the German submarine counteroffensive did not defeat the surface ships. But no one could be certain that the Germans would be forced 
to turn over their newly captured territory. Not only were the occupiers holding Belgian and French civilians against their will and often brutalizing them, but France had lost 55% of its coal resources, 70% of its steel production facilities, and 80% of its iron ore and iron production industry. With the French continuing to dictate the strategic priorities of the Entente and demanding the return of their country, the British and French forces would keep strong pressure on the Western Front and dig the enemy forces out of their occupied positions at the point of the bayonet. However, as Canadian infantryman H.R. Alley noted grimly, all through 1915, you were on a shoestring, and a pretty frayed shoestring at that. The Entente never had enough high explosive shells to blast their way through the strong German defenses, let alone the communication tools to coordinate attacks over wide fronts. The British portion of the offensive was waged against Aubers Ridge, which ran 1.5 kilometers south of the Ypres salient. This operation was also launched to relieve pressure on the Ypres front by drawing away enemy reinforcements and guns. As in the Ypres salient, which overlooked, was overlooked by Passchendaele Ridge to the east, Aubers Ridge offered enemy forward artillery observers an advantage over the infantry spread out below them. They called in fire orders, observing the fall of rounds, and correcting them to target forming up areas, trenches, and essential roads. But the British were not defenseless. In grouping the forces for an attack, they had a significant advantage in their number of troops and guns. Aware that a hurried assault would only leave their infantry hanging on the barbed wire, First Army Commander General Douglas Haig planned for a slow, methodical destruction of the German lines, which were so heavily fortified as to include concrete bunkers housing machine guns. Haig, a dour Scotsman who had risen to command one of Britain's two armies, and who within the year would take over the entire BEF, had never been known for his intelligence. He had barely made it through staff college, often relying on friends for answers. But he did understand warfare, and was far more competent than his legion of critics have assessed over the years. More than a simple-minded cavalryman, Haig actively studied the problems of modern warfare and even wrote a pre-war tactical manual. No mean feat for a man whom many considered illiterate. Haig's deep spirituality gave him a sense of certainty that helped him to deal with the stress of command. Even if he and his troops might have been better off had he suffered more pangs of doubt. However, he had learned the practical lessons of the 1914 fighting, during which attacking troops that had been shattered by dug-in defenders required the support of larger, more devastating artillery bombardments. Like all senior officers, Haig was stymied by the unprecedented stalemate on the Western Front, where enemy forces held all the advantages, ground of their choosing, barbed wire that was difficult to cut, and therefore channeled attackers into kill grounds to be mowed down by machine gunners who barely had to aim, and defenders who could rest relatively safely behind sandbag walls while their attackers were forced to run and stumble forward over shell fields.
In the past, the armies would have tried to maneuver around strong points like Arbor's Ridge, but at this point, the British and Canadian forces had nowhere else to go on the Western Front. The entire war had become an enormous siege, except that the enemy could not be starved out of their position, as the rear area was largely untouchable, allowing for the free movement of men, munitions, and food to the garrison troops in the German forward trench system. Every attack was a frontal attack. Aware that both the French and Germans had often been annihilated in such plunge-ahead offensives in 1914 and early 1915, Haig believed that artillery would help even the odds. The guns would smash the enemy defenses and allow the infantry to cross the killing ground before punching through, wreaking havoc on the enemy's lines of communication and logistical areas, and eventually collapsing the entire front. The siege lines would be broken and the British would harass the broken enemy armies back into Germany if they did not surrender first. Haig and his commanders were right in relying on the artillery, but they did not have did they not yet have enough guns or shells or gunners with sufficient tactical skills to hit small targets from several kilometers away. Guns firing in an indirect role from behind cover were very hard to hit because they could not be seen and the interaction between gunners and reconnaissance planes was in its infancy. The German situation was no better. One Dr. No note said, it is of no use firing with field guns against artillery in position behind, color, behind cover. This is merely a waste of ammunition. Only the heavier guns could hit these targets and they were in short supply. Furthermore, both sides suffered from technical limitations. The fuses that detonated the shells were fragile pieces of machinery and were difficult to mass produce. Throughout 1915, the fuses were often not sensitive enough to detonate a shell on its contact with barbed wire. And so the shells did not explode until they were in the ground thereby reducing their effectiveness. Shellfire was one of the components essential in achieving tactical victory, but it was far from perfected. Heavy British howitzers and field guns blasted the German front with more than 100,000 shells during the 60-hour bombardment before zero hour when the troops would attack. This was an almost unbelievable weight of fire, and Haig and his officers could perhaps be excused for thinking that now, finally, a breakthrough might be achieved. <coughs> the attack to the east of the village of Festiburg was launched at night on May 15th by two British divisions and one Indian division, followed by a third the next morning. Haig's forces advanced on an 800 meter front. Not only was the strength of the artillery barrage unprecedented, but the British attacked at night for an added surprise. Unfortunately, the inherent confusion of moving thousands of men through cratered, uneven terrain in darkness nearly negated the element of surprise, and the Germans were soon alerted to the advancing troops. But the British had some success 
that captured enemy front lines, even beating back counterattacks. In response, the Germans retreated to a new prepared line, 1,700 meters to the east. It was a wise decision and proved that the Germans were willing to trade useless land for time and space. The British High Command saw the German retreat as a sign that the enemy's armies were disintegrating. The British were infused with the belief in the sanctity of ground and an unwillingness to ever give up an inch to the enemy. Any retreat on the part of their enemy was viewed through that lens. They therefore pressed the attack. Haig called on Major General Alderson's 1st Canadian Division to be ready to exploit success. Elements of the 2nd and 3rd Canadian Infantry Brigades had been moved into the reserve lines on the night of May 15th, but they had not being engaged in the fighting. From May 15th to 17th, the artillery thundered, but the Canadian infantry were left with tightened stomachs as they waited for the order to enter into battle. Amidst the confusion and the crumbling British attack, the second phase was delayed time and time again. The soldiers suffered under the stress of the unknown. By May 17th, a steady drizzle had turned into rain, and the battlefield, already chewed up by artillery fire, was reduced to a quagmire. This was ideal ground for the defending German forces. As at Ypres, the water table was high, and much of the natural, natural drainage had been destroyed by artillery fire. The ground was now a morass of mud, with the water-filled craters, ditches, and streams that crisscrossed the broken expanse, making parts of the battlefield nearly impassable. Years of farming in the area had also taken down most of the trees and created a relatively flat ground that allowed defenders broad and uninterrupted fields of fire. Word that an attack would go ahead finally came on the night of May 17th, but orders from Corps headquarters were late, and the British and Canadian preliminary bombardment was working over the German lines. Even as Brigadier General Richard Turner briefed his battalion commanders on the impending operation. His words were not inspiring. Most of the tactical intelligence was little more than guesses. The only course to go ahead and make the best of the situation. As at Ypres, however, this would be a battle in which the Brigadier would have little control, and any hope of driving home the attack would rest instead with the battalion commanders and even individual company and platoon officers. Four companies from the 14th and 16th battalions were to attack in broad daylight on May 18th as part of a larger British offensive. The plan had an air of unreality as it, be, it had been set by staff officers and commanders in the rear who had not surveyed the battlefield. The Canadians were to capture a series of trenches culminating in the orchard, a key enemy strong point. The operation involved the close coordination of several battalions and companies that were to support one another or guard open flanks. But no mechanism was in place 
to allow for communication between British and Canadian units. Worse was yet to come. The maps provided to the troops were completely inaccurate, off by several hundred meters and unbelievably printed geographically backwards and upside down, with south at the top, east on the left. Some officers resorted to trying to read them as reflected in a mirror, and all found them nearly impossible to memorize. The numbers printed on the maps denoting enemy, enemy positions such as M6 meant nothing to anyone, and no distinction was made among a hedge, ditch, or track. Heavy artillery bombardments had also obliterated many of the landmarks, further rendering the maps useless. As well as these cartographic monstrosities, as Captain A. F. Dugu, an artillery staff officer with the Canadians, described them, the infantry was not trusted with additional information that might have been useful to them in preparing for battle. Lieutenant Alexander MacPhail accused senior officers of hoarding information, stating that the men were sedulously prevented from knowing anything that was going on. This secrecy was no doubt a misguided attempt by senior officers to control the battle and compartmentalize the fighting units but it showed a shocking lack of trust in subordinate officers who would, as Ypres proved, end up making most of the command decisions at the front, often under shell fire and cut off from the rear. Without proper information, the battle amounted to soldiers blindly stumbling forward in a frontal assault against dug-in German defenders in broad daylight. As the minutes ticked down towards the 5 p.m. zero hour, the four companies of frontline troops tensed as their artillery built to a final crescendo. The 18-pounders fired at a low trajectory to clear the wire, and the passing of shells just above the heads of the troops was nerve-rattling. Alerted by the British barrage, which was heavier than normal, the observant Germans guessed that an attack was in store, and not only rushed reinforcements forward, but called down heavier artillery fire of their own. Soon there seemed to be more German shells falling than British ones. Officers of the 14th Battalion recognized the futility of the operation, but had little recourse. They ordered the troops to thin out to five paces between men and advance in four skirmish lines of about 200 meters in depth. As per the accepted attack doctrine of the time, the artillery fire was to stop at 5 p.m., just when the infantry was to go over the top. The shelling stopped because most gunners felt that they could not guarantee the safety of their own troops while firing over their heads. All hoped that the enemy's defenses were shattered. This was the doctrine of fire preceding movement, as opposed to combining fire and movement. That would be introduced a year later. As the Canadian attackers prepared to leave the trenches, at zero hour, they found the barrage still pounding the enemy lines after the 5 p.m. set time for them to go over the top. Confused, the Canadian attackers could not leave their trenches to advance into their own barrage and were forced to wait for it to stop. This mix-up was due to faulty communication from front to rear and among the various arms, primarily the infantry and the artillery.
Unfortunately, to the north, British troops of the Guards Brigade went over when they were ordered, and many German defenders on the Canadian front fired into their exposed flank of the unfortunate guards, who also had uncut wire and undestroyed machine guns on their own enemy front to worry about as they moved forward. Worse, the guards' action brought the Germans out of the trenches. The desultory artillery fire from the Canadian and British gunners did almost nothing to suppress the enemy fire, and when the barrage petered off about 25 minutes later, the Canadians realized that if they moved forward, they would be mounting a frontal assault against enemy positions that were clearly still manned in strength. Canadian officers were, officers were left with a terrible choice. One, order and advance into likely slaughter, or two, stay in the relative safety of the trenches, but leave the British to the north abandoned, and, not knowing if the guards had succeeded or failed, vulnerable to a counterattack from the enemy forces on the Canadian front. One cannot imagine the terrible tension building among officers who stared uncomprehendingly at each other, weighing such options. The Canadians would go. In those final seconds, as the last shells were fired, the battlefield took on a strange silence, broken by the whistles of the officers, urging their men over the top. As the first waves of the 14th and 16th battalions emerged from the trenches and spilled out into no man's land, they were immediately met by German rifle and machine gun fire, with metal tearing through the ranks the advance companies fanned out and moved forward, but in the confusion, and while traversing over broken ground, the waves began to drift into one another, causing an intermingling of forces. These were not parade ground conditions, and the advance was not pretty. The bunching up of troops, a common occurrence among men under fire, who instinct instinctively grouped together for protection, made them easier targets. Despite the terrible enemy fire, the Canadians drove forward, overrunning a series of German trenches about 400 meters from their start line. Private Romeo Huell of the 14th Battalion recounted, A bayonet charge is a street fight, magnified and made 10,000 times more fierce. While the Canadians cleared a few trenches with bayonet and bullet at close range, this outer crust was only held lightly. Most of the defenders having already pulled back the secondary, strongly fortified defenses. Having crashed through this first line, the Canadians were beset by confusion. Officers found it hard to get the rank and file to move out of their new trenches and forward again into the lethal killing ground that needed to be crossed before the Canadians could close with the main body of German defenders. Commanding B Company of the 14th Battalion, Major Alan Shaw, a former insurance broker who had put in a decade and a half of militia service and had fought in the South African War, rallied his troops even though he had been shot in the head. He was killed by a second bullet while reconnoitering the front in an attempt to push through a soft spot in the enemy line. No such openings were found. With their ranks decimated and officers wounded, Few men knew where to go for their secondary objectives. Follow-on forces and the two battalion commanders even further back had little evidence of how the battle was unfolding. 
The first runner to arrive, however, was not encouraging. Weaving his way to the rear, exhausted and caked in mud, he stammered out a message. The Canadians are all blown to hell! There is terrible murder up there! This news did not help much, since the situation was beyond dire. But if the message lacked detail, its sentiment was very clear. Under heavy artillery fire and a driving rain, the exhausted, soaked, and cold infantry sought safety by shoveling deeper into the dissolving trenches, heaving liquid mud over the parapet. Of the enemy's fire, C.J. Johnson of the 14th Battalion remarked, They had the range right down to a science. The Germans shelled the front all day and into the night, only stopping around 2 a.m. The historian of the German 57th Regiment, the unit that defended against the attack, noted that the Canadians encountered such an effective barrage that the attack collapsed after a few minutes. The Canadian and British artillery did little to respond to this overwhelming bombardment or to the nearly uninterrupted fire from Maxim machine guns and Mauser rifles as they were too far back and few forward observers were in place to guide artillery fire. Without adequate forward observers or a robust communication system, and with the small divisional staff overwhelmed after having taken control of the artillery batteries from three other divisions, the artillery guns in the rear could not correct the fall of their shells or even respond to the ever-changing situation at the front. Canadian flesh was pitted against German steel. Frontline units were situated in a nightmare landscape of charred tree stumps and pulpy ground, but it was the torn and bloody corpses that gave the field its horrific quality. Men had been mowed down in straight lines by machine guns. Others were hanging on the barbed wire like bizarre scarecrows. Slain men littered the battlefield. New Canadian corpses and older decaying British and German ones. The smell of rotting flesh and fresh blood was overpowering. Detached body parts littered the area. A shredded torso in a shell hole, a bloody stump of a leg still wearing puttee and boot. The Canadians captured half a kilometer of French field and, in the military vernacular of the time, straightened out the line to ensure that the Germans were not able to drive a wedge into the British positions, but they did so at a terrible cost. After the punishing shell fire stopped, Brigadier Turner ordered reserve troops to support the 14th and 16th, which were now overextended and vulnerable. But the infantry moving into the nightmare landscape well understood their limited chances on the battlefield. Private Charles Pierce of the Kilted 13th Battalion wrote a final letter to his Dear mother, he had enlisted with his best friend, Dick, in Belleville, against his mother's wishes. In the letter he handed to Dick, should he be killed, he penned, While I hope to live to come back home, I pray more that God will give me strength to fight the good fight. I hope that it will be comforting to you to know that I feel that, happen what may, I have achieved one great good and given my life for others. Pierce survived the battle uninjured, despite continual harrowing journeys 
back and forth, carrying wounded soldiers to the advanced medical dressing stations. His friend Dick was not so lucky. He was shot in the mouth, the bullet ricocheting up and out through his right eye, shattering his facial bones. His war was over less than a month after less than a month at the front, although he did survive. While Dick eventually returned home, Pierce never did. He was shot down to his death in an aircraft over the Somme after transferring to the Royal Flying Corps to escape the slaughter on the ground. The Germans were content to let the Canadians wallow in the mud under their heavy shell fire, aware that several hundred meters of no man's land still separated their forces. The overextended Canadians suffered as supplies were mired at the rear, with all ground in between raked with fire. Most of the soldiers were now out of water and food. The brackish fitted water that pooled in shell craters was strained through handkerchiefs and gagged down for momentary relief of thirst. One infantryman wrote of his section's desperation, I crawled back on the first night and got some water from a shell hole to make tea. We boiled it and enjoyed our hot drink. Next morning I went back to the same shell hole and was about to fill my tin when I saw the dead face of a German soldier looking up at me through the water. Under such conditions, most Canadians decided to go thirsty. As day broke on May 19th, the new Canadian trenches were in full view of German snipers and gunners, with shrapnel airbursts raining jagged metal and whirling ball bearings down on their soft-capped heads. The infantry became one with the earth, hugging trench walls and trying to keep out of sight. But most of the trenches had been built in haste, in the dark, and without much planning. And this haphazard construction allowed some of the German snipers to worm their way into deadly positions on the flanks. They fired into the Canadian lines, many of which did not run parallel to the enemy front. Men died all day long. The occasional brave or frustrated Canadian infantryman fired off a few snapshots from his Ross rifle, but as at Ypres, the flawed weapon continued to malfunction and jam. Soldiers risked their lives to crawl around, rooting through British corpses in the hope of securing a Lee Enfield. With new troops coming to the front, the Germans realized that the failed British offensive was being prolonged, so they further reinforced the sector. The veteran 2nd Guards Reserve Division was one of the new units sent up to the German front, and their line remained strongly helped. In fact, it was the Canadians who were more vulnerable after the attack. The shell fire fell all day and the Dominion infantrymen caught in these new weak positions could do almost nothing to respond to their tormentors. Trooper T. L. Gordon of Lord Strathcona's course, a unit then in reserve, wrote of the shelling. You could hear it coming as a dull moan. Then it gradually develops into a weird whistle. Then a shriek, and the earth rocks under you. You are covered with mud and earth, and you are glad you are alive. Simultaneously, with the bursting of a shell, comes the cries and moans of the wounded. When you are exposed to this for quite a while, it gets rather nerve-wracking. 
Such phlegmatic understatements helped these trench warriors deal with the nearly unbearable strain of battle, which would only get worse. <laughs>